question that everyone wants an answer to. What is the secret to extraordinary success? Is it grit? Is it determination? Luck? Or is it who you know? I've been in business now for some 30 years, and I can tell you, all successful entrepreneurs share a few unique qualities. Certain traits that give them the upper hand. But what are they, and can they be learned? I'm on a mission to find out what drives Britain's best entrepreneurs. This is it. This is it. I don't like something not being as good as it can be. Would you die for your brand? I almost did. And uncover the human side that determines their success or failure. We're driven by self-doubt. Maybe it was all that billion and heartache. I want them to reveal their individual recipes for success. You definitely are a hippie with a calculator. <laughs> you are quite manipulative. So I can discover just how they made their millions. If these guys ever sold this business to me, you guys wouldn't know what hit you. Mess with me, I'm going to turn you to stone. You take a hundred million pound check for your share now? Mm. Success in business isn't a fine science. I've turned tiny startups into multi-million pound companies. Not all of my ventures have succeeded. Business is tough. But I've always believed there are certain factors that can give us all a fighting chance. I'm on a journey to get inside the minds of two of the country's top business people, and I'm hoping to discover the ways in which the most unlikely characters become multi-millionaires. I'll be spending time with Richard Reed, founder of a smoothie company with a £165 million turnover, and Michelle Moan, the self-made inspiration behind a multi-million pound lingerie business, and who, according to the Rich List, is worth £50 million. Have they both followed the same blueprint to success, or is it their difference that matters most? My journey begins at Fruit Towers in West London, the home of the most successful smoothie company in the UK, and its co-founder, Richard Reed. Another tie is off right, today. Look at that, the no tie, off. no tie. How are you? Good to see you. How's it going? Very Have good. you seen the difference to the way that you travel? Yeah, but I must have We're grass-covered vans and you're this thing. I want to be in the grass-covered van. Yeah? Okay. It's good fun, actually. It dances. It's got hydraulics, so it inches around and you can blare out music for the speakers at the front. We take it to festivals, go out sampling with it. And a lot of my people have met their partners through it as well. Richard is leading a new wave of entrepreneurs who have embraced a business style pioneered in the US by companies like Google. He believes that if his employees feel at home, they'll be extra productive. But despite opting for an open collar, I still felt overdressed. It almost does, doesn't look like a working environment, though. It looks like, like, a, like a London play centre. What kind of it? The most important thing is, first of all, have a smoothie. Anyway, so this is the sort of the chill-out area. It's basically a big um, communal area for What's people to come in for informal meetings. What's that? Oh, well, we call this thing the smoothie wheel of fortune. So sometimes if we can't make a decision, we'll put all the different options on here and then spin it and let the, the smoothie wheel of fortune decide so you for put, us. You put your ideas in here? Yeah. And, and whichever it. one it turns to is the one exactly. you choose. That's what you go for. You make business decisions on the wheel of fortune? <laughs> Not for like big decisions, but for when you've got a few different options and a bit of fun. So you've got, it's got sort of like a home feel, like it's, the, it's your kitchen. Yeah. And then you've got people in the sitting room. Mm -hmm. You let people wear whatever they want to wear. Yeah, no, and that's the point. If you want to wear a suit, you're extremely welcome to wear a suit. But you'd look a we bit... Don't, we don't tell bit, people... You'd look a bit like me now, wouldn't you? I, I feel now as if I've come into a business environment for the first time and I'm completely out of place. Well, I, I have feel, to say... I'd probably come in tomorrow well, no, because you're, We would never judge. We would never judge someone on what they wore. That's just... We're not, it's not that type of vibe. You've got to wear what you're most comfortable with so you can do your best work. I've literally seen one person sat in his desk in his dressing gown. Now, even that was slightly pushing the sort of the limits of what you can wear around the office. <laughs> his dressing gown. <laughs> his dressing gown. He said he was cold. Yeah. <laughs> After reading Geography at Cambridge, Richard set up the Fruit Juice Company in 1999 with fellow graduates John Wright and Adam Ballon. We have a little house phrase, which is if you're 70% sure, then go for it. Don't wait around trying to be 100% confident it's the right decision. I've had the, the very rare privilege, I think, to have spent the last 12 years doing something that I've found to be incredibly exciting and interesting and mind-expanding and life-enhancing and doing it with my two closest friends. So who wants to come and make some smoothies? Today, Richard sells over 2 million bottles of smoothies a week, but they're expanding their range, moving into ready meals and taking on the giants of the orange juice market. 
It's about being natural. Natural ingredients, making natural food. But also, the, the idea of being natural, talking naturally, acting naturally. People can come in that work at this and be their natural selves at work each day. Kimberly is joining us as our new Persis Ledger Specialist. She can make the sound of a dolphin. <laughs> we won't hide behind some sort of weird corporate facade. We'll just be who we are. It's always good to be exactly who you are, as long as you realise that running a business is about making money. And I wanted to find out if Richard had the money-making gene. When did you actually feel or think to yourself, you know what, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, it was, I was 16 and I was working in a dog biscuit factory in Huddersfield. And my job paid two pounds an hour and the task I was assigned to get down on my hands and knees and pick up the dog biscuits off the factory floor that had fallen off the conveyor belt. So I went up to the foreman and said, do you have a brush I could borrow? So you had a brush, I could, I could do this job better. And he just looked at me dead in the eyes and said, son, you are the brush. And I thought that, that was the split second I decided, you know what, there's got to be a better way than this. So I, I left the dog biscuit factory that afternoon, went home and set up a little business called Two Men Went to Mow, which was just mowing lawns in the village where I grew up. And before I knew it, I'm billing myself out at £2.50 an hour and getting so much work that I could actually give jobs to my mates. So I billed them out at £2.50 an hour, paid them £2.25 an hour, so I made a little bit extra there. If you don't like the situation, then go about changing it rather than complaining about it. Having the confidence to change what you don't like is an entrepreneurial trait I recognise. But was this Cambridge graduate helped by having a privileged upbringing? I'm from Huddersfield in the, in the north of England. Um, my dad started as a bus conductor and worked his way up um, to become like a manager in the local bus company. My mum was a nurse. My mum and dad decided they wanted to pay me to go for a private education. That was funded by my mum going out and working at night, so she'd work two nights a week. My parents made massive sacrifices for us as kids. What was your school life like? First year, I came... 44th out of 45 in my class in the exams, right, so one from the bottom. You know, I think something clicked with me, and I worked hard the next year, and I came 17th, and I remember going home to sort of say, you know, really pleased myself, I came 17th, and my mum just said, I, I think you can do better than that. And I remember thinking, wow. So you think from that one defining moment, that was the self-belief injection that your mum gave you? I think it made, me, you I think it made me recalibrate, yeah. I think it made me think, oh, yeah, I felt pretty good, but then it was like, well, actually, you know, you better. yeah, you can do better. You can do better. And you did. Right? Yeah and almost the rest is history. Yeah. To truly uncover why Richard has become so successful, I needed the answers to some uncomfortable business questions. But that would have to wait. First, I've got an appointment with an entrepreneur who is poles apart from Richard Reed. The next stop on my journey is East Kilbride, where I'm meeting Michelle Moan, the tycoon behind one of the country's leading lingerie labels. I wonder what her corporate headquarters might reveal about her particular approach to business. Hello. Hello, Hello. How, how are, are you? you? Fine, how are you? Very good. Nice to see you. Wow, thank you very much for Welcome. Me in. This is our Scottish headquarters and we've got Hong Kong and we've got China as well. Um, I wanted it shaped like a breast. So you're now in the breast of the building. And when we go upstairs you'll see it more. And you, you're not honestly, you're not winding me up. This is not honestly, real. I, it's real, yeah. And it's kind of shaped like a double D. So there you go. This is the boss. Yep. This looks far too staged for me. You can't be all tidy workers. This is how we run things. And if you look any any cupboards that you want to look in, they will all be organised. What, even the cupboard? Yeah, they've all got to be organised, yeah. I use cupboards in my office to hide things. Is it really like this? For real? It all felt too good to be true. Was this an act just for me? And then in here is a meeting room. Graphics as well. But as Michelle showed me around, I knew there was one particular member of staff who could help me learn more. The one employee who knows everything about their boss, the PA. Shall we go and meet Laura? Laura? Hi there. Come and meet Peter. What's it like working for Michelle? <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very different from anywhere I've worked before. It's stressful at times, but all in all, good. And what's the hardest thing working for a, a busy, successful entrepreneur? Um, Michelle's a perfectionist. You can plan one thing and within 10 minutes she wants it completely different. She's just like... So she changes her mind a lot? Oh, yeah. All yeah, the time? Yeah, I'm not scared of change. It annoys people around you because they've been working on it for so long. But I know everything about Michelle, so I have to be one step ahead of her. And what scares you about Michelle as a boss? I can tell when Michelle's in not the best of moods. I call it the care bear stare because she may look at you in a certain way. You know? But she can look and you're like, oh, no. Do you think you're paid enough? Yes. 
I've not looked after. Can you not see that sports ID sports car out there? That's yeah. not her. That's yes, that's Laurie. Yes, the yeah. job. Is that really? Yes. Oh, okay. You've got to look after your team because they look after you. Michelle's gel-filled bra became an overnight success in the year 2000 after Julia Roberts wore one in the film Erin Brockovich. Well, you know, I'm just an East End girl from East End of Glasgow and always had a dream. Baltimore's now one of the biggest lingerie brands in the country. After leaving school without qualifications, she has risen to take on the biggest lingerie brands in the world. What are we doing here? We're capturing the market for people who want an everyday bra. Michelle is a mum of three juggling family life and business commitments from day one. I do believe that we will become the Victoria's Secrets of the UK. Michelle knows how to manipulate the press. And she does everything she can to keep her brand and her celebrity persona in the public eye. I am very demanding. I'm a perfectionist. Let me tuck your label in there. No. Sorry. It's just not ultimate. I'm impatient. And I always want the best. I think I'm a nightmare. You Absolutely. expect quite a lot, I think. Well, I think that's but why we are where we are, yeah. In this very, very competitive market. Who was uh, the last person to get sacked? Um, well, when was it? This morning? No, it was a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. I wouldn't say sacked. No, we just had an agreement. OK. <laughs> I'm going to find out a little bit more about this lady. <laughs> Michelle comes across as a demanding leader. At Fruit Towers, the business environment that Richard and his co-founders have encouraged couldn't be more different. Where's your office in this? I don't have an office, sir. We're, we're completely open plans. No one has offices. I just sit over in the corner. And this is yours area here? Yeah, so I sit in just in this desk here now. If I'm sitting here. I can sit you say, have a little um, chat. Hi, Johnny, come and take a seat. Come yeah. and to me. Well, we have this as well, so you can pull out everyone's filing cabinet. That's something you can sit on. Because, again, we just want to keep it as easy as possible for people to be speaking to, to each other, rather than rely on email and phone calls. We, we're big fans of going as much face-to-face -face as possible. So I don't know whether I'll be able to take you seriously, yes, sitting there swinging in a chair. <laughs> it's like, it's a bit, sort of, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Well, I, well, I don't think it's... I, Do people honestly sitting sit there and together. swing? Huh? Do they sit in there and swing and talk to you? Um, Richard, you're, yeah. you don't. Do they? I guess I would not judge people on the seat that they sit on. I judge people no, no, I'm just saying it's very distracting. And, right. I, I totally want to be accessible and have people, if they've got something, they just want to ask quickly. We're not sort of putting walls up between each other. I couldn't stop thinking about dressing down someone for not performing whilst they sat swinging a basket like Little Miss Muffet. But I was trying to keep an open mind about the way Richard runs the organisation. Good afternoon, creative team. Hello. Hi, I'm Peter. If you can call it organised. So, what's it like working here? Do you find it odd working on an astroturf and... No, it's pretty, you get pretty used to it. No? Yeah. Wouldn't you tidy up a bit? No, this, this corner especially can't be tidy. Can't you? Really? Yeah, I don't think so, because that's... We're working. It's a good working environment, though, to work in chaos and mess. Yeah, it's a slight, you know, controlled chaos. If these guys ever sold this business to me, I'd... You guys wouldn't know what hit you. I think Peter finds it a bit too untidy. Really, Peter? I, I find it a bit edgy, which I, it doesn't surprise me. So, you know, I'm seeing guys with, you know, that are dressed very differently, with respect. I would never let my staff turn up to work like this, but something's working. Richard's grown from nothing to having a 75% share of the smoothie market. People work harder here than they will do in 99% of businesses. People put in a huge amount of energy, personal commitment, take it very, very seriously. It's just because we're sort of wearing T-shirts doesn't mean we're not working really hard. Is he really hard taskmaster? On the plus side, he's incredibly inspirational. He's incredibly honest. He'll tell you when something's rubbish and when something's great really quickly, which helps. He's probably uh, he gets really excited sometimes and a bit carried away and might change his mind about stuff. He's always like thinking lots of things in his head and he walks out of meetings, which I, I didn't know it was true, but they told me he had a reputation that that's it, I'm out, and then he goes out. And you're like, you know, okay, okay. Brilliant. And, um, you like, you enjoy this, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm so, let me just say, I'm so gonna come to your office <laughs> with a camera and go in and ask your guys what they think about this you. Is great, isn't just it? so you know. Beneath what seems like chaos, I was starting to see how Richard inspires his staff to work hard for him. Up in Glasgow, I had an inkling that Michelle Moan takes a much more traditional and orderly approach. OK, so this is my room. Wow, it's like a hotel room. I have never seen post-it notes 
so evenly spread and so perfectly placed. Yep, massive OCD. Yep, I've had it for years since I was a child. That's exactly how I run my life. I get four hours sleep a night. And so you like um, Maggie Thatcher then, four hours sleep? She's, that's what people say, yeah. So are you the, the iron lady of, of bra and knickers? I do, maybe. My husband says get that bloody black man out of this bedroom. My husband's away. your partner in the business. So yes. He's, he's been there from the start, he's seen it grow. Yep. He doesn't like the limelight at all and people think that it's just all me but actually, you know, he's the managing director and very talented at what he does as well. So he's very much involved in the business. Yeah, very much so. But whilst her husband keeps a low profile, this tactical publicist is out there mixing it with the rich and famous. But it's not just for fun. Partnering with good-looking celebrities is all part of her PR strategy. So these are all of your girls, are they? Or a um, selection of? Yeah, a selection of. Not all of them. I, rec um, I recognise you've got Rachel Hunter. Rachel Hunter, Penny Lancaster, Helena Christensen, Sarah Harden, uh, Mel B. The list goes on and on and on. Wow. Yeah. In 2003, Michelle hit the publicity jackpot when she dropped Rod Stewart's girlfriend, Penny Lancaster, and replaced her with... Rachel Hunter, his ex-wife. Was it a tactical move to get Penny, um, Penny on board? Well, I worked with Penny for two years, and yes, we became close and everything else, And but things just went... Um, just things changed. It went on for months and months and months, but, you know, I really did affect me personally. How much of that was a turning point for your business, in, in a positive way? Uh, massive, because it was worldwide press for the, the brand. It's the Richard Branson School of PR. Create a multi-million pound business and use the popular press as free advertising for it. What? Is that wallpaper? Yeah, it's wallpaper. Uh -huh. I thought it would be quite a nice idea to turn one wall into wallpaper. Yeah. Michelle moaned. That's it for my OBE. Michelle moaned. Yeah. <laughs> Any more? Michelle moaned. With Mel. Oh, with Mel B. That's New York Fashion Week. The Mail, Michelle. Yeah. What's that one, Michelle? Prentice, yeah. Hello, magazine, Michelle. Hello. <laughs> Slim down, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The Michelle wall. There's a storyboard here. Yeah. This one wall tells a story yeah. about you. Mm -hmm. Probably, I mean, when I was really overweight, you know, I put on six and a half stone when I went through all the hard times building the company um, and put my house up to the bank three times as security and I piled on the weight. And now... There's a picture up there where I finally lost six stone. Would you die for your brand? Oh, that's true. Well, I've got kids, but to put it this way, when I tell you the story about how we almost um, went bust, um, I almost did. Yeah. Wow. I would go from here to hell for Ultim and the rest of our brand as well. Michelle seems like an uncompromising boss, but to fully understand how she became a force in the lingerie business, I needed to hear how it all began. You thought one day of starting a company? Yeah, I, I, I got made redundant. Went to a dinner dance one night wearing a very uncomfortable cleavage bra and went back to the table drunk and said, I'm going to invent a bra. Is, is that how it happened? That's how it happened, yeah. And uh, three years I worked from my bedroom. Got into debt of £240,000. Begged, robbed. Meanwhile, my, my husband just, you know, kept saying I was nuts. And I went to the launch in London and... We had surgeons, well, actors dressed as surgeons. I dressed them all up as plastic surgeons, saying, ban the Ultimo bra. And I got so much press coverage. And the police came up and said, who's responsible for this? I said, me. And he says, well, move right now or we're going to arrest you. I said, I'll get me more publicity. <laughs> arrest me. <laughs> so you recognised at that point that your business, for it to be successful, was based around publicity? I had no money. I had no money for advertising. So you I was competing in an in a industry where some of the big lingerie brands would spend £2 million pounds launching a product. I had £500 pounds left within five hours. Yeah. You very much strike me as all or nothing. Running this business and building this business has probably taken a lot away from my life. Mm. But it is my life. I'm starting to see two sides to Michelle now that's starting to come out for me. The one that actually would take care of you and nurture and look after. Mm -hmm. And the one that says, if you mess with me, I'm going to turn you to stone. <laughs> and it's that. Well, yeah. And it's uh -huh. interesting seeing that psyche because I'm almost like the silent assassin. <laughs> That's not something to be proud of. No, but in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, because you're driving your business and taking it really forward. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to stop Michelle. Yeah, it is fair, but for me, there's, um, there's one thing that if you break with me, you never really get back. And that's trust. Self-belief is a key trait in all successful entrepreneurs. And Michelle has certainly seen off some challenging times. 
Back in West London, I wondered if the reason Richard Reed always seems to be smiling is because his route to success had been a much easier ride. Helpfully, he's decorated the stairs with a brief company history. Business is starting to get a little bit bigger. We start doing our dancing grass fans. This is our recipe book, which we published. The success Richard found in the early years of his business was based on an unlikely model. It seems like they were more focused on giving money away than actually making it. This is Fruit Stock, which is a, a festival that we did in Regent's Park. It was free to go to. We did it as a thank you to all our drinkers. We give 10% of our profits to charity each year, mainly to, I think, the Innocent Foundation, which is countries in the developing world where the fruit comes from. But spreading goodwill is only possible when you're making a profit. Right, now we're up to 2008, which is your... It's definitely the Annus Homilus for, for Innocent. After four years of seamless growth, Richard had to face the harsh realities of running a multi-million pound business. A new competitor launched, the pound crashed, and fruit prices rocketed, almost spelling the end. We haven't cut our prices once in ten years. And the second, the big competitor launched against us and took a large part of our market share, which meant that we lost a, a huge amount of money. In oh, fact, how much did you lose? Oh, it was like, it's in the millions. And it was more, we lost more in that year of 2008 than we made in the entire company's history. So it, it wiped out any profits that we'd, we'd been making. He had a tough decision to make. Drastically downsize the operation or sell a stake in the business. Relief came in the unlikely form of Coca-Cola. Yeah, so these guys, these guys invested in, in, in early 2009 in a way that's just been, it's been brilliant for the business. Because myself, Adam and John have retained full control of the business. And as you can see, we're, we're continuing to do business in, in a very innocent way. I'm sure we're going to talk more about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I was surprised that a business focused on health and charity sought a partnership with one of the biggest corporate names in the fizzy drinks market. But before I challenged him about it, I needed to get a more precise picture of Richard and his business. So Richard, what's happening in there? So this is our commercial team. We test the adverts to... We, we want to make sure they work, and this is... You test the advert in advance to see how does it score on people. Do they, do they like it? Do they remember it? Do they uh, relate it to innocence? And so you can, you can judge before you spend all your money on media, which is going to be the ad that people like the most, and that's essentially what those different scores are testing. There's quite serious stuff happening in this room, though. Yes, no, absolutely. We do take things seriously. Fruit Towers is an interesting contradiction. At first, you walk through the doors and think you've entered Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Rich, do you want to cut anything up? Oh, I like watching pizza. <laughs> but as I was joining in the fun in the juice lab, I was starting to see where the genius of this business lay. Behind the AstroTurf and the lunchtime barbecues, there's a hierarchy that demands the very best from its people. The front of house is very much, hey guys, come in, have fun. We've got grass, we've got table tennis tables, we've got a lovely environment for you to work in. It was very intriguing walking past that office where I saw clearly some quite serious behind the scenes real planning going on. It's not a contradiction, it's all part of the same whole. We want to take the bits seriously that you need to take seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously in the process of it. One of your staff members earlier said you walk out of meetings, you have a short attention span in mm, terms mm, of, mm. right, look, I need to move on. You're quite random in your decisions and you're quite seemingly changeable. I like change. I, I, I like the future. I like, uh, you know, things to evolve. Am I indecisive? I don't, I don't like something not being as good as it can be. And I don't like someone... So you are a perfectionist, then? I think it's one of my drivers, yeah. I think, and to the extent where I do know it can cause chaos at the last minute by me sort of going, well, how about that? So I'm, I have sort of learned over the last couple of years to moderate it. Richard is a clever and unconventional entrepreneur who believes he can make money by focusing on a mission. But surely, without profit, there is no mission. If you ask and speak to... Lots of entrepreneurs all up and down the country, and you say to them, what is your main objective? Well, their main objective would be to generate income and make profit. See, I don't agree. And that's not your objective at all? I don't agree. I think, in my experience, when you look at the world's greatest businesses, they are led primarily by a deeply felt sense of mission. And money is fairly incidental. But in 2008, we got it wrong, OK? We made a mistake, the market moved against us, and we weren't prepared for it. Of course, the money is part of it, and I, I don't want to be disingenuous and imply that it's not. I'm hoping that, you know, I will become wealthy from, from innocence, and for that, I'll be both appreciative and grateful. I think the world's greatest businesses are led by a sense of mission and purpose. Google, who set up in the same month, the same year as us, and have grown at the same time to be an $80 billion company, so in, in some ways you could say they're beating us, 
they talk about in one sentence that they exist to organize the world's information and make it universally available. That's a simple, clear mission, and it explains what their business is all about. And that's what Innocence led by. My journey has really just begun, but I was already discovering that an entrepreneur's business is very much a reflection of who they are as people. Michelle Moan is incredibly tenacious, but I wondered where her relentless drive had come from, and if her formula for success could last forever. At first glance, Richard Reed's approach appears counterintuitive, concentrating on the good his brand can achieve rather than the profit. But we've also heard from his childhood just how calculating he can be. Most successful businessmen and women I know can pinpoint exactly where and when their entrepreneurial journey began. To find out where that was for Richard and Michelle, I'm visiting places that lie at opposite ends of the country and of the social spectrum. Michelle is taking me on a tour of her hometown of Gallagate. You're getting into the East End of Glasgow, really down to earth, hardworking. And Richard is showing me round Cambridge, the city where his entrepreneurial journey began. In Glasgow, I was to find the rags to riches cliche for real. Lots and lots of memories growing up here, and this is where I started my first um, business when I was ten, ten years old. You were ten. Yeah, so delivering the papers in the East End. And then when I was eleven, I had seventeen teenagers working for me. Um, so you had a bunch of people working for you at eleven. I did, yeah. The first stop would be Michelle's secondary school, a place she left without any qualifications at the age of fifteen. This is it. This is it. Yeah. This was where she was told that a future working down the local supermarket was the best she could expect. Wow. How does it, does it feel like to be back here? Very really strange. Does it? Yeah. But um. What's your best memory? Yeah. My best memory. Um. I don't really have nice memories, to be honest with you. I I, I really struggled at school. Academically, uh, I was awful, um, and I think always been told, you know, you're a failure and you'll never do well. And I suppose everyone around me kept saying, Michelle, you can't do this and you can't do that. And I used to say, Why? Why do you say you can't? Surely you can. Surely we can find a way. And I used to challenge everyone. Were you bullied? Um, kind of, yeah. I was a bit. Um, yeah, because I wore my uniform and so you, were you my always mum and dad smart? were always, no, you're wearing your uniform. And, and what about your teachers? Did they have a, a little inkling that Michelle Moan was going to become a successful entrepreneur? I don't think so. I remember when I was 15, I had to go and see my careers teacher. I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And she said, what does that mean? It could have been a determination to prove her teachers wrong that drove Michelle in those early days. But I was about to discover even deeper reasons for her desire to be an East End girl done good. I always wanted my own room. And um, my dad cut half of a single bed. He put in the groom cupboard and lowered the ceiling and I put sticking it, uh, stickers, which were all stars above it, and I loved it so much. The next stop on our tour was the house Michelle grew up in. So this, this is, is it. it, yeah. So which was the actual house, which one? Uh, well, first of all, I grew up there, one up. So first floor? Just first floor, yeah. Okay. And then my dad, um, when he was my age, got confined to a wheelchair, uh, paralysed from the waist down, a disease, hemangioma, blood vessels in the spinal cord. So he couldn't obviously get up the stairs in a wheelchair. So we moved to 54 ground right. Which is here. And that was the first time I had my own bedroom. Wow, this, this is, is it, it, 54? Yeah, that's, that was my mum and dad's bedroom. I, I dare you to ring the bell. Oh, no, I can't do that. Henderson. No, maybe it's ground two. <gasps> What's that? Should I, I go in? I promise I've not teed anything up. Hiya. Hi there. Come in. Is that okay? Yeah, no. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow, I can't believe this is my old house and that that is the bathroom, isn't it? That's the bathroom. That, that was your room, that was your room. That was my room. Oh, this is my own. Do you know, I loved this bedroom. This was my first bedroom. <laughs> and I kept it so neat and tidy. From this tenement, Michelle embarked on a career in publicity that began with occasional work as a model. By the age of 26, she was head of marketing for a national brewery. 
her old neighbour, Tricia, still lives next door. How are you? Uh, and has documented her remarkable rise to success. Oh, you got pictures? I've actually got paper cuttings as well, but I didn't want to do Look at that. <laughs> terrible, terrible model. Terrible. <laughs> you shouldn't talk to me. No. You keep this quiet. No. Talk no. <laughs> Thank you very much. It proves that anybody that's got a dream and if they follow it through, they can do it. That's true. Michelle was just basically working class and she'd done it all proud. I could see in Michelle's eyes how much this visit to her old house meant. But facing up to her past wasn't going to be easy. Over dinner, I wanted to find out more. What's your earliest bad memory right here? I would say that there was lots of tough times that I try and blank out and that was the illness of my dad. That was my mum, you know, being through depression, losing my wee brother. You know, I always used to go to bed crying, I'm not going to my dad in the morning and it was just, it, it was horrible. But How old were you when your brother died? Um, I was about eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. I remember all of it. Yeah. Every single bit of it, yeah. You come from a hard background. You've spent all of your life trying to get out of it. So there's something that's, that makes Michelle special. Do you see yourself as special? Do you see yourself as lucky? I grew up with you know, bad news after bad news and I don't want that. I will not accept when people say because you're from the East End you cannot be successful. In contrast, the hard work of Richard's parents to fund his private education paid off. He became one of the elite few to make it to St John's College, Cambridge. So we haven't been in here for 20 years. He shared a room with Adam Ballon and John Wright. Together, they would become the co-founders of the famous smoothie brand. So this is the canteen? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. The innocent canteen. Three meals a day for three years here, pretty much. Yeah. Is, is that right? Dinner. And yeah, but this is definitely where it started because the, the three of us became friends literally from the first night in college and we all met in the college bar and I think we sort of bonded, didn't we, over a, a, a sort of a love of, you know, <laughs> nocturnal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and what did you do? Because I know you did geography, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Was that because you couldn't think of anything else? <laughs> or the honest answer is when I was looking at the different, um, the different options, the only topic that had less lectures was land economy, which had seven hours a week and geography had eight hours a week and everything else had more. And so I went for geography. <laughs> Okay. So what, I did economics. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I did manufacturing, so getting stuff made. It's almost like perfect, doesn't it? You've got somebody that economics knows how to run a business. You've got somebody that actually doesn't really care what they do because they just wanted to have fun. And then you've got somebody that actually knows the whole manufacturing process to put it all together. That's, that's interesting, though, isn't it? Because it does fit. Mm. No, we, I think it was, a, it was a sort of lucky, fortunate you know, uh, part of the formula. What you had here was three really close friends that had very different skills but had a complete shared sort of set of values and, and, and vision and things that they wanted to achieve and that's, I think, uh, that was the, the, the starting place for the whole business where the success has come from. It's incredibly rare that three mates thrown together at university go on to create a multi-million pound business. To try and work out just how it happened, the boys took me to meet Colin, their residential porter. So they were pranksters then? They enjoyed their college life. They, as I say, they kept the porters on the toes all the time. <laughs> but the porters loved them. The time we caught them, they always said, we're innocent. That's <laughs> 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 That's where you got the name from. We're innocent. We're innocent. <laughs> Richard's business story begins here in Cambridge, in a dark and dingy basement. Well, this is it. This is it. That's an underground garage. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> The enterprising trio transformed this boiler room into the most popular student nightclub for miles around. We'd be turning people away at the door. I think people, people were coming for the free pizza, not the music. <laughs> that, was the, that was our dreadful original strategy that we were offered free pizza at nine o'clock trying to get people down early. And what happened is a load of rugby boys turned up, ate the free pizza and then left. And so we were left with an empty nightclub and full of pizza boxes. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it all started. I had a lot of fun while you did it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, has, that doesn't seem to have changed much. No, and it's, it's, the, it's just one of the best bits of and you're doing it with your two closest mates, so it's just such good fun. Both Richard and Michelle wanted to create better futures for themselves because of the circumstances that surrounded them. Richard desperately wanted to make his parents proud and repay the sacrifices they had made to give him a world-class education. 
and Michelle was driven by a desire to do better than those around her. Oh, how nice is that? So what is it that links all entrepreneurs? Is there a formula for making millions? If you ask the investors who discovered Michelle and Richard, it wasn't their business plans that impressed them. Morris Pinto bought 18% of Innocent for a quarter of a million pounds. I take care less about what the business and the industry is or what the business idea is and more about the people. I thought they were extremely bright, extremely articulate. Let me say it's the best management team I've ever worked with. Sir Tom Hunter backed Ultimo with £100,000. You can look at the business plan, you can look at the numbers and, and you know, you've read as many business plans as me and none of them really do what they ever say they're going to do. You're really only investing in the person. We saw something in Michelle, that determination, that look in, in, in her eye, and you then, you then make an investment in the person. It's reported that both investors made very healthy returns when they sold their shares. In London, Scotland's first billionaire was giving me a further insight into what has pushed Michelle Moan to succeed. Even though Michelle puts forward this, you know, she's, she, she, she can be quite fragile. And um, the thing people don't understand about most entrepreneurs is, is that we are, we are driven by self-doubt. A lot of successful people who outwardly you think are so confident, but we're all trying to prove ourselves all the time. Yeah. my final encounter, Michelle had invited me to her Mayfair apartment so I could have a glimpse into her private world. It was here I hoped to uncover the characteristics that had brought her success. Hello. 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 Welcome. How are you? How are you? How are you? But nothing could have prepared me for the obsessive attention to detail that awaited. Okay, can you come? Look at that. That's amazing. Everything has its place. That shouldn't be dirty, is it? No. Everything has to be organised. So everything's in order. Five, twenty, fifties. Yeah. Same hangers. Yeah. Every single one the same colour. Everything has to be the same. And the kids have got KPIs that they don't muck the hangers up and... You give your kids... <laughs> I'm not going to tell KPIs, you anymore. KPIs, Key Performance Indicators, which yeah. are business drivers yeah. to measure against for success. You do that with your own kids. And the people you in don't. the house, yeah. I do. If your drawers are not organised, and your cupboards are not organised, and your family are not organised, then your life is a mess. You have to compartmentalise everything in your life. And you don't change between business and your personal life, which is different. A lot of people, really? yeah, a lot of people are very different in business to they are when they're at home. To be successful, you have to be able to exert control. But Michelle takes it to another level. There must be a reason why she has to organise every detail around her. And the words of Tom Hunter were still ringing in my ears. Is it self-doubt that makes her like this? Are you proud of yourself? Um, I think I am now. I think now that I've lost, you know, all the weight and I'm getting fit. You know, I'm, I'm getting my life in order. Um, I was punishing myself for ten years. And I just kept eating and eating and eating and eating because I did not feel that I should have money and success. But I'm, I feel I'm a lot more content, but I still don't think I've made it yet. So would you say that you're lonely or in search of something? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you're doing these things to perhaps fill a void or fill something. I suppose being an entrepreneur is very lonely. You'll know it yourself. Um, where, you know, you'll take all the worry and everything else on your own shoulders and... Um, Do you feel pressure? Oh, feel I feel pressure 24-7. Yeah. yeah. And I can't imagine life without the pressure, to be honest. I'm trying to understand the psyche behind an entrepreneur. There's a lot of similarities I see in me and you. Mm -hmm. um, I see that you have to have control. I can mm -hmm. see that you are quite manipulative. I can see that you're very forthright and you know where you want to get to. Yeah. But at the same time, I can also see a lot of insecurity. When I was last in your offices, you said something to me that hit me quite hard uh -huh. because I've never spoken to another entrepreneur before that's actually said, yeah, I, I considered committing suicide and I was yeah. in a very dark place in my, in my life. Yeah. How, take me back to that time of how you felt to get to that point. I just think that I tried my hardest and... I suppose I was failing. 
And um, who were you letting down? Uh, I was letting down my family, you know. And it's the fear of going back to how I grew up, of I suppose struggling. Um, but I just, I, I just could not see a way out. I just couldn't. When you took me back to the east end of Glasgow, uh-huh. there was a quite a touching moment when you got to see the neighbours and you got to see your house. Mm. But there's a lot about it that almost says, I can't remember a lot of things. I'm not um, blanking it all out, but I suppose that, you know, the, the growing up and with my wee brother dying and my father, you know, being confined to a wheelchair at the age of 38, and I just thought, woof, you know, and it started to all come back to me. Oh dear, I said I wouldn't cry. <laughs> um, but, but maybe it was all that just bullying and heartache that's made me fight to get to here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't apologise because it's something to be proud of and it gives a lot of people inspiration. And the reality is that an entrepreneur is a makeup of all different things. You've been through. A journey, haven't you? Yes. And I think that everybody sees that journey is it's easy, it's glamorous. We see Michelle walking down red carpets. We see her on magazines looking beautiful. But the hardness and the hardships of the journey. And I would say that the next few years, in pursuit of happiness and success, I think you're going to achieve it. Thank you. I really do. I hope so. <laughs> Uncovering the reason why someone strives for perfection can be an emotional experience. I wondered if my final meeting with Richard would be so highly charged. I'm in the Malvern Hills to examine the relationship between Richard and one of his suppliers to hopefully uncover the savvy businessman behind the self-proclaimed hippie brand. There's nothing hippie about him. Nothing. Hello? Well, hello. Well, no, I've never been a fly on the wall at a meeting. He does not suffer fools gladly. Where's the suit? What do you think? Pretty good. Uh, Red and green. Yeah, he's like matching. We've got planned this. How are you? Now, can I introduce Ed? Ed. Ed. Some of our most treasured farmers. So this is all, they're all black currants that we see now. Wow. Have you been working together for a while? Mm, We started in 2004. That was our first year that we, and we did, we bought less than a tonne of Ed's black currants. Whereas this year, we've just bought 210 tonnes. What I was really interested in was how Richard and Ed made money from each other. It can't be cheap buying homegrown fruit, and I was keen to find out about their margins. Probably for the first time in history, our price to you per bricks is lower than our price to the concentrate people per bricks. I doubt if that's ever happened before. That's a decision on our part. And the prices have gone up, but we want these guys to be there tomorrow. So, interesting concept here. Richard and his business is supporting a local farmer. Mm-hmm. Local farmer, actually, in reality, is supporting Richard. Yes. You've got a very interesting partnership between the two of you. Yes. yes. Correct. And we, I think we both share this philosophy that we will do better over the longer term by collaborating. It is a mutually beneficial relationship. But that's the key. It's not better for Ed. He's financially willing to lower the price of that quality product uh, to you to support your model. Well, I think we should let Ed say what Ed thinks. Well, the black carrot market is sometimes referred to as being the, the, the pig of the soft fruit industry. It is very cyclical. And to always insist on the jackpot in the peak year is not necessarily good business. They can take the product off the shelf tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, It can price itself off the shelf. We want that product to still be there. Richard looked uncomfortable discussing profit margins with a price supplier. But I was relieved to discover that he does focus on a money-making model. After all, without profit, he can't give to charity. The clever thing is, the farmer has bought into Richard's mission, and that's the very reason why he offers such a great deal. Now that's a shrewd way of doing business. You have naturally found a place where you can really represent your brand by creating and maintaining an image. Everybody's thinking, oh, this guy, why doesn't everybody be like Richard? You know, he starts a business, he's got high ethics, he's helping the local community, and he gives away to charity. But the reality is, you are all of those things, but you're also a very tactical, very shrewd entrepreneur as well. I take that as a big compliment. 
there's no money to give to charity if you don't make any money in the first place. So we are absolutely proud to be entrepreneurs and businessmen and capitalists. And we have an altruistic aim in addition to that as well. I tell you, the world would be a very different place if more businesses did, because it's basically saying if we just took 10 percent and made sure it was allocated to people and to countries that quite frankly need it more than we do, it would redistribute wealth whilst absolutely still protecting the capitalist system that we found to be the best way of working. You, you, you definitely are a hippie with a calculator. <laughs> we are not just um, six formers messing around. I think some people assume that because we sometimes wear T-shirts to work, but what you wear does not reflect on how hard you work. It's been a big, tough challenge all of the way. It's been extremely enjoyable and exciting too. The way Richard does business is admirable, and for that I have to give him and his partners credit. But there was still a burning question I had to ask. With such a strong business ethos, how did they justify selling a majority share of their business to Coca-Cola? If you'd known me three years ago, and I'd said, Richard, you've got this deal with Coca-Cola, you can meet them four times a year, they want you to run the business, and they're going to give you 30 million. And I said, Richard, I'm going to give you the same deal, I'll give you 30 million. <laughs> Which one would you choose, Coca-Cola or Peter Jones? Uh, well, after having seen you on Dragon's Den, I would definitely choose Coca-Cola. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's outrageous. Man, you're a tough negotiator, and you definitely wouldn't have extended the terms that Coca-Cola did. But I kind of liken it to a little bit like I've got a nice, seriously famous health club chain, and Cadbury's invested in my business. Was there any of the three of you that thought, I don't want to do this? Without that money coming in from Coke, we would have been a business hugely retrenching. We would have had to make half the team redundant. We would have had to cancel our international expansion. I feel like I'm interviewing like, a politician. You're not answering my question. Oh, what was the question? Did, 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 any, of did us, any of you say no? No, we will absolutely. So you were all... all 100% us. all three of us. It was a very unusual deal that they did where they would put in money, but absolutely take a back seat along myself, Adam and John, to keep full control of the company. Even the hardened cynics would admit now that we are absolutely more innocent than we've ever been. We've pushed even further into our sustainable agricultural projects. We've continued to fund the charities. It's mainly just asking their advice. You know, they've been in business running one of the world's most popular brands for 125 years. In a, in a very small way, there are things that take them innocent as well. And so I really do think it's been a relationship that's been, has been good for both parties. Have you got an ultimate goal? I want to get rich and die poor. The idea is I would love to sort of, you know, get to be you know, in a strong position financially, but by the end of life... You know, giving it away. Coca-Cola come to you knocking on the door and saying, guys, we want to buy you out. Is that a conversation that you will have? Hmm. Don't know, actually. 20 million each? 50 million? Keep going, mate. 100 each? What price do you put on it? I don't know is the short answer. You take a 100 million pound check for your share now? Well, you've just gone from 20 to 50 to 120 seconds, so I'm going to hold that a little bit further. 100 million? for your share in innocent cash in the back of the Maybach. I'd have to speak to my wife. Unsurprisingly, it was an indecisive response from Richard, but I felt I'd come as close as possible to him admitting he's in it for the money, even if he'll eventually give it all away. Spending time with Michelle Moan was both enjoyable and intriguing. Under her tough exterior, I found someone who is quite fragile. Not a trait you'd openly associate with being an entrepreneur. But like many of us, it's that self-doubt that drives her. I'm now happy with what I've achieved. I do my best, you know, and, I, and if you can't do your best, then there's no point. Richard Reed was a tough nut to crack, but now I understand why he's such a success. He has very cleverly created a product that harnesses his values. My business ethos is... Um, do something you love with people that you love. Um, do it in a way that you can be proud of. Genuinely try and make something better. These are just two inspiring ways to make millions. Every entrepreneur has their own eclectic mix of hard work, luck, skill and self-belief. And there's one thing for sure. We don't readily take no for an answer. Your job as the entrepreneur is to hear the no and turn it into a yes. I don't just accept no. I always say, why, why, why? If I don't take risks every single day, life becomes boring. Will Italy become the next victim of Europe's debt crisis? It's night on BBC Two at 10.30 after comedy with Ramsey Nesbitt next.
just two inspiring ways to make millions. Every entrepreneur has their own eclectic mix of hard work, luck, skill and self-belief. And there's one thing for sure, we don't readily take no for an answer. Your job as the entrepreneur is to hear the no and turn it into a yes. I don't just accept no. I always say why, why, why. If I don't take risks every single day, life becomes boring. Italy become the next victim of Europe's debt crisis. News lights on BBC Two at 10.30 after comedy with Ramsey Nesbitt next. And I think that everybody sees that journey is it's easy, it's glamorous. We see Michelle walking down red carpets. We see her on magazines looking beautiful. But the hardness and the hardships of the journey and I would say that the next few years, in pursuit of happiness and success, I think you're going to achieve it. Thank you. I really do. I hope so. <laughs> Uncovering the reason why someone strives for perfection can be an emotional experience. I wondered if my final meeting with Richard would be so highly charged. I'm in the Malvern Hills to examine the relationship between Richard and one of his suppliers to hopefully uncover the savvy businessman behind the self-proclaimed hippie brand. There's nothing hippie about him. Nothing. Hello? Well, hello. Well, no, I've never been a fly on the wall at a meeting. He does not suffer fools gladly. Where's the suit? What do you think? Pretty good. <laughs> Red and green. Yeah, he's like matching. We've well, got planned this. How are you? Now, can I introduce Ed? Ed. Ed. So our most treasured farmers. So this is all, they're all black currants that we see now? Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And you've been working together for a while? Mm, we started in 2004, that was our yeah. first year that we, and we did, we bought less than a tonne of Ed's black currants, whereas this year we've just bought 210 tonnes. What I was really interested in was how Richard and Ed made money from each other. It can't be cheap buying homegrown fruit, and I was keen to find out about their margins. Hello? Well, hello. Well, no, I've never been a fly on the wall at, at a meeting. He does not suffer fools gladly. Where's the suit? What do you think? Pretty good. <laughs> Red and green. Yeah, he's like matching. We've well, got planned this. How are you? Now, can I introduce Ed? Ed. Ed. Some of our most treasured Great farmers. So this is all, they're all black currants that we see now. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And you've been working together for a while? Mm, we started in 2004. That was our yeah. first year that we, and we did, we bought less than a tonne of Ed's black currants. Whereas this year... We've just bought 210 tons. What I was really interested in was how Richard and Ed made money from each other. It can't be cheap buying homegrown fruit, and I was keen to find out about their margins. Probably for the first time in history, our price to you per bricks is lower than our price to the concentrate people per bricks. I doubt if that's ever happened before. That's a decision on our part. And the prices have gone up. But we want these guys to be there tomorrow. So, interesting concept here. Richard and his business is supporting a local farmer. Mm -hmm. Local farmer, actually, in reality, is supporting Richard. Yes. You've got a very interesting partnership between the two of you. Yes, yes. correct. And we, I think we both share this philosophy that we will do better over the longer term by collaborating. It is a mutually beneficial relationship. But that's the key. It's not better for Ed. He's financially willing to lower the price of that quality product uh, to you to support your model. Well, I think we should let Ed say what Ed thinks. Well, and of the social spectrum. Michelle is taking me on a tour of her hometown of Gallagate. You're getting into the extent of Glasgow. Really down to earth, hard working. Ed. And Richard is showing me round Cambridge, the city where his entrepreneurial journey began. In Glasgow, I was to find the rags to riches cliche for real. Lots and lots of memories growing up here, and this is where I started my first um, business when I was 10, 10 years old. You were 10? Yeah, so delivering the papers in the East End. And then when I was 11, I had 17 teenagers working for me. Um, so you had a bunch of people working for you at 11? I did, yeah. The first stop would be Michelle's secondary school, a place she left without any qualifications at the age of 15. This is it? This is it, yeah. This was where she was told that a future working down the local supermarket was the best she could expect. Wow. 
What does it, it feel like to be back here? It's really yeah. strange. Does it? Yeah. But, um, What's your best memory? Yeah. My best memory? Um, I don't really have nice memories, to be honest with you. I, I, I really struggled at school, academically. Uh, I was awful. Um, and I think always been told, you know, you're a failure and you'll never do well. And that's I'll give you 30 million. <laughs> Which one would you choose, Coca-Cola or Peter Jones? Uh, well, after having seen you on Dragon's Den, I would definitely choose Coca-Cola. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> that's outrageous. Man, you're a tough negotiator and you definitely wouldn't have extended the terms that Coca-Cola did. But I kind of liken it to a little bit like I've got a nice, seriously famous health club chain and... Cadbury's invest in my business. Was there any of the three of you that thought, I don't want to do this? Without that money coming in from Coke, we would have been a business hugely retrenching. We would have had to make half the team redundant. We would have had to cancel our international expansion. I feel like I'm interviewing like, a politician. You're not answering my question. Oh, what was the question? Did, 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 any, of did us, any of you say no? No, we will absolutely. So you were all... all 100% us. all three of us. It was a very unusual deal that they did where they would put in money, but absolutely take a back seat like myself, Adam and John, to keep full control of the company. Even the hardened cynics would admit now that we are absolutely more innocent than we've ever been. We've pushed even further into our sustainable agricultural projects. We've continued to fund the charities. It's mainly just asking their advice. You know, they've been in business running one of the world's most popular brands for 125 years. In a, in a very small way, there are things that take them innocent as well. And so I really do think it's been a relationship that's been, has been good for both parties. Have you got an ultimate goal? I want to get rich and die poor. The idea is I would love to sort of, you know, get to be you know, in a strong position financially, but by the end of life... Sort of you know, giving it away. Coca-Cola come to you knocking on the door and saying, guys, we want to buy you out. Laundry brands would spend £2 million launching a product. I had £500 left within five hours, yeah. You very much strike me as all or nothing. Running this business and building this business has probably taken a lot away from my life, mm. but it is my life. I'm starting to see two sides to Michelle now that's starting to come out for me. The one that actually would take care of you and nurture and look after, mm -hmm. and the one that says, if you mess with me, I'm going to turn you to stone. <laughs> and it's that. Well, yeah. And it's uh -huh. interesting seeing that psyche, because I'm almost like the silent assassin. <laughs> That's not something to be proud of. No, but in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, because you're driving your business and taking it really forward. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to stop Michelle. Yeah, it's fair, but for me, there's, um, there's one thing that if you break with me, you never really get back. And that's trust. Self-belief is a key trait in all successful entrepreneurs. And Michelle has certainly seen off some challenging times. Back in West London, I wondered if the reason Richard Reed always seems to be smiling is because his route to success had been a much easier ride. Helpfully, he's decorated the stairs with a brief company history. Business starting to get a little bit bigger and we started doing our dancing grass bands. This is our recipe book which we published. The success Richard found in the early years of his business was based on an unlikely model. It seems like they were more focused on giving money away than actually making it. This is fruit stock which is... ...and the countries that quite frankly need it more than we do. It would redistribute wealth whilst absolutely still protecting the capitalist system that we found to be the best way of working. You, you, you definitely are a hippie with a calculator. <laughs> we are not just... Um, six formers messing around. I think some people assume that because we sometimes wear t-shirts to work, but what you wear does not reflect on how hard you work. It's been a big, tough challenge all of the way. It's been extremely enjoyable and exciting too. The way Richard does business is admirable, and for that I have to give him and his partners credit. But there was still a burning question I had to ask. With such a strong business ethos, how did they justify selling a majority share of their business to Coca-Cola? If you'd known me three years ago and I'd said, Richard, you've got this deal with Coca-Cola, you can meet them four times a year, they want you to run the business and they're going to give you 30 million. And I said, Richard, I'm going to give you the same deal, I'll give you 30 million. <laughs> Which one would you choose, Coca-Cola or Peter Jones? Uh, well, after having seen you on Dragon's Den, I would definitely choose Coca-Cola. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's outrageous. Man, you're a tough negotiator and you definitely wouldn't have extended the terms that Coca-Cola did. But I kind of liken it to a little bit like I've got a nice, seriously famous health club chain and Cadbury's invest in my business. Was there any of the three of you that thought, I don't want to do this? 
without that money coming in from Coke, we would have been a bit... I paid them 225 an hour, so made a little bit extra there. If you don't like the situation, then go about changing it rather than complaining about it. Having the confidence to change what you don't like is an entrepreneurial trait I recognise. But was this Cambridge graduate helped by having a privileged upbringing? I'm from Huddersfield in the, in the north of England. Um, my dad started as a bus conductor and worked his way up. Um, we were like managing the local bus company. My mum was a nurse. My mum and dad decided they wanted to pay me to go for uh, a private education. That was funded by my mum going out and working nights, so she'd work two nights a week. My parents made massive sacrifices for us as kids. What was your school life like? First year, I came... 44th out of 45 in my class in the exams, right, so one from the bottom. You know, I think something clicked with me, and I worked hard the next year, and I came 17th, and I remember going home to sort of say, you know, really pleased myself, I came 17th, and my mum just said, I-, I think you can do better than that. And I remember thinking, wow. So you think from that one defining moment, that was the self-belief injection that your mum gave you? I think it made me, you I think it made me recalibrate, yeah. I think it made me think, oh, yeah, that felt pretty good, but then it was like, well, actually, you know, you can do better. yeah, you can do better. You can do better. And you did. And yeah. You- and almost the rest is history. Yeah. To truly uncover why Richard has become so successful, I needed the answers to some uncomfortable business questions. But that would have to wait. First, I've got an appointment with an entrepreneur who is poles apart from Richard Reed. You expect quite a lot, I think. Well, I think that's but why we are where we are, yeah. In this very, very competitive market. Who was uh, the last person to get sacked? Um, well, when was it? This morning? No, it was a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. I wouldn't say sacked. No, we just had an agreement. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to find out a little bit more about this lady. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle comes across as a demanding leader. At Fruit Towers, the business environment that Richard and his co-founders have encouraged couldn't be more different. Where's your office in this? I don't have an office, sir. We're, we're completely open plans. No one has offices. I just sit over in the corner. This is yours area here? Yeah, so I sit in just in this desk here now. But I'm sitting here. I can sit you in say, have a little um, chat. Hi, Johnny. Come and take a seat. Come yeah. and talk to me. Well, we have this as well, so you can pull out everyone's file and cabinet. That's something you can sit on. Because, again, we just want to keep it as easy as possible for people to speak to, to each other rather than rely on email and phone calls. We, we're big fans of going as much face-to-face as possible. So I don't know whether I'll be able to take you seriously yes, sitting there swinging in a chair. <laughs> it's like, it's a bit, sort of, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Well, I, well, I don't think it's... I, do people honestly sit in there and, there and swing? Huh? Do they sit in there and swing and talk to you? Um, Richard, you're, yeah. you don't. Do they? I guess I would not judge people on the seat that they sit on. I judge people. No, no, I'm just saying it's very distracting. And... Right. I, I tell you want to be extra as well, so you can pull out everyone's filing cabinet. That's something you can sit on. Because again, we just want to keep it as easy as possible for people to speak to, to each other rather than rely on email and phone calls. We, we're big fans of going as much face to face as possible. So I don't know whether I'll be able to take you seriously, yes, sitting there swinging in a chair. <laughs> it's like, it's a bit sort of. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Well. I, well, I don't think it's... I, do people honestly sit in there and up. swing? Huh? Do they sit in there and swing and talk to you? Um, Richard, you're, yeah. you don't. Do they? I guess I would not judge people on the seat that they sit on. I judge people No, no, I'm just saying it's very distracting. And, right. I, I totally want to be accessible and have people... If they've got something they just want to ask quickly... We're not sort of putting balls up between each other. I couldn't stop thinking about dressing down someone for not performing whilst they sat swinging a basket like Little Miss Muffet but I was trying to keep an open mind about the way Richard runs the organisation. Good afternoon, creative team. Hello. Hi, I'm Peter. If you can call it organised. So, what's it like working here? Do you find it odd working on an astroturf and... No, it's pretty, you get pretty used to it. Pretty no? Quick, yeah. Wouldn't you tidy up a bit? No, this, this corner especially can't be tidy. Really? Yeah, I don't think so, because that's... We're working. It's a good working environment, though, to work in chaos and mess. Yeah, it's a slight, you know, controlled chaos. If these guys ever sold this business to me, I'd... You guys wouldn't know what hit you. I think Peter finds it a bit too untidy. Really? Peter. I, I find it a bit edgy, which I, it doesn't surprise me. So, you know, I'm seeing guys with, you know, that are dressed very differently, with respect. The closest mate, so it's just such good fun. Both Richard and Michelle wanted to create better futures for themselves because of the circumstances that surrounded them. desperately wanted to make his parents proud and repay the sacrifices they had made to give him a world-class education. And Michelle was driven by a desire to do better than those around her. 
Oh, how nice is that? So what is it that links all entrepreneurs? Is there a formula for making millions? If you ask the investors who discovered Michelle and Richard, it wasn't their business plans that impressed them. Morris Pinto bought 18% of Innocent for a quarter of a million pounds. I take care less about what the business and the industry is or what the business idea is and more about the people. I thought they were extremely bright, extremely articulate. Let me say it's the best management team I've ever worked with. Sir Tom Hunter backed Ultimo with £100,000. You can look at the business plan, you can look at the numbers and, and you know, you've read as many business plans as me and none of them really do what they ever say they're going to do. You're really only investing in the person. We saw something in Michelle, that determination, that look in, in, in her eye, and you then, you then make an investment in the person. It's reported that both investors made very healthy returns when they sold their shares. Surely you can. Surely we can find a way. And I used to challenge everyone. Were you bullied? Um, kind of, yeah. I was a bit. Um, yeah, because I wore my uniform and so you, you my always dad smart. were always, you know, you're wearing your uniform. And, and what about your teachers? Did they have a, a little inkling that Michelle Moan was going to become a successful entrepreneur? I don't think so. I remember when I was 15, I had to go and see my careers teacher. I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And she said, what does that mean? It could have been a determination to prove her teachers wrong that drove Michelle in those early days. But I was about to discover even deeper reasons for her desire to be an East End girl done good. I always wanted my own room and um, my dad cut half of a single bed. He put in the broom cupboard and lowered the ceiling and I put sticky, uh, stickers which were all stars above it and I loved it so much. The next stop on our tour was the house Michelle grew up in. So this, this is, is it? it? Yeah. So which was the actual house? Which one? Uh, well, first of all, I grew up there, one up. So first floor? Just first floor, yeah. Okay. And then my dad, um, when he was my age, got confined to a wheelchair, uh, paralysed from the waist down, a disease, hemangioma, blood vessels in the spinal cord. So he couldn't obviously get up the stairs in a wheelchair, so we moved to 54 ground right. Just and here. that was the first time I had my own bedroom. Wow, this, this is, is it, it. 54. Yeah, that's that's him and grateful. I think the world's greatest businesses are led by a sense of mission and purpose. Google, who set up in the same month, of the same year as us, and have grown at the same time to be an 80 billion dollar company. So in in some ways, you could say they're beating us. They talk about in one sentence that they exist to organise the world's information and make it universally available. That's a simple, clear mission, and it explains what their business is all about. And that's what Innocence led by. journey has really just begun, but I was already discovering that an entrepreneur's business is very much a reflection of who they are as people. Michelle Moan is incredibly tenacious, but I wondered where her relentless drive had come from, and if her formula for success could last forever. At first glance, Richard Reed's approach appears counterintuitive, concentrating on the good his brand can achieve rather than the profit. But we've also heard from his childhood just how calculating he can be. Most successful businessmen and women I know can pinpoint exactly where and when their entrepreneurial journey began. To find out where that was for Richard and Michelle, I'm visiting places that lie at opposite ends of the country and of the social spectrum. Michelle is taking me on a tour of her hometown of Gallagate. You're getting into the extent of Glasgow, really down to earth, hard working. Where's the suit? What do you think? Pretty good. Uh, Red and green. Yeah, he's like matching. We've well, not planned this. How are you? Now, can I introduce Ed? Ed. Ed. So our most treasured Great farmers. So this is all, they're all black currants that we see now. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And you've been working together for a while? Mm, we started in 2004. That was our yeah. first year that we, and we did, we bought less than a tonne of Ed's black currants. Whereas this year, we just bought 210 tonnes. What I was really interested in was how Richard and Ed made money from each other can't be cheap buying homegrown fruit, and I was keen to find out about their margins. Probably for the first time in history, our price to you per bricks is lower than our price to the concentrate people per bricks. I doubt if that's ever happened before. That's a decision on our part. And the prices have gone up, but we want these guys to be there tomorrow. So, interesting concept here. Richard and his business is supporting a local farmer. Mm -hmm. 
Michael Farmer actually, in reality, is supporting Richard. Yes. You've got a very interesting partnership between the two of you. Yes. yes. Correct. And we, I think we both share this philosophy that we will do better over the longer term by collaborating. It is a mutually beneficial relationship. But that's the key. It's not better for Ed. He's financially willing to lower the price of that quality product uh, to you to support your model. Well, I think we should let Ed say what Ed thinks. Well, the black carrot market is sometimes referred to as being the, the, the pig of the software industry. It is very cyclical. And to always... We're discussing profit margins with a price supplier. But I was relieved to discover that he does focus on a money-making model. After all, without profit, he can't give to charity. The clever thing is, the farmer has bought into Richard's mission. And that's the very reason why he offers such a great deal. Now that's a shrewd way of doing business. You have naturally found a place where you can really represent your brand by creating and maintaining an image. You know, everybody's thinking, oh, this guy, why doesn't everybody be like Richard? You know, he starts a business, he's got high ethics, he's helping the local community, and he gives away to charity. But the reality is, you are all of those things, but you're also a very tactical, very shrewd entrepreneur as well. I take that as a big compliment. There's no money to give to charity if you don't make any money in the first place. So we are absolutely proud to be entrepreneurs and businessmen and capitalists. And we have an altruistic aim in addition to that as well. I tell you, the world would be a very different place if more businesses did, because it's basically saying if we just took 10 percent and made sure it was allocated to people and to countries that quite frankly need it more than we do, it would redistribute wealth whilst absolutely still protecting the capitalist system that we found to be the best way of working. You, you, you definitely are a hippie with a calculator. <laughs> we are not just um, six formers messing around. I think some people assume that because we sometimes wear T-shirts to work, but what you wear does not reflect 